Okay, y'all. Thank you for those of you who are joining us virtually, those of you who are joining us in person. We have got Tony Wright speaking with us. He has almost 30 years in marketing experience, and I know that he can do a way better job of telling you all the amazing things that he has done um, rather than me. But he has served with DFWSEM as the board president twice as well as being a board ambassador. So we're very happy to have him back. Let's give a big round of applause to Tony. Thanks. Is the uh, presentation on there or do I need to hook it up? What's that? Okay. I'm going to talk to you guys while I do this real quick. Um, just tell you a little bit about myself and why you should, why you should listen to me. Um, my name is Tony Wright. I am the CEO and founder of Wright IMC, uh, which is a full service digital marketing firm with deep roots in search. So let me get this in here. If it'll actually fit in there. I don't know why I have trouble with HDMI cables. Does anybody else have trouble with HDMI cables? They just don't want to fit. There we go. What's that? Yeah, I got it. I got. I was just trying to put things in the wrong, put put square pegs in the round in a round hole. How's that work? Let me. Yeah, okay, but anyways, um, my background is running agencies. I have run um, agencies my entire career. Um, I since uh, I was first started in an agency was I when I was just someone who wasn't, uh, who didn't know anything to do, what to do. Um, I will tell you that I, um, I have done some pretty cool things. I got to, I, I ran a uh, crisis communication for American Airlines during 9-11. I've, um, I've worked with everyone from Coca-Cola and Disney to your small plumber and lawyer. Um, I have a lot of uh, experience in, um, in a lot of different verticals, but one of my biggest passions has always been, uh, let's see if you can see that, has always been customer service and account management. Let's see if I can go into full screen here. Maybe. That's not full screen. We're a slideshow on that. That's good. Oh, see the tab. I lost it. Oh, come on. One, two, three. Here we go. And the slideshow is. What's that? You tell me. You, because I am old now, and I'm like my mother trying to trying to uh, access things. I feel like. Oh, can you guys see that? But let me let me do one thing. There we go. Slideshow. Let's go. Ah, there we go. Okay, what this is today is account management training. Some of you guys may be working with clients. You may be working internally. Um, but what I have done is I've taken my, the training that I put together over the years for my team, and I have put it into this deck. Now, we're going to go quick because we're already running out of time. And uh, this is actually usually four training sessions that I put together. So um, I, may, I may skip a couple things as we go through, but uh, I'm hoping to really get through this and even have a little time for uh, questions afterwards. So basically what we're going to cover today, and this sounds boring, but it's not really not. Uh, we're going to talk about the principles of account management, what you need to do, basic client management tactics, um, how to handle upset clients and controlling your clients, in other words, making your life easier. Now, um, we're going to cover this, and this is really uh, good for people who are just trying to get into an agency and want to work as an account manager, or if you're in-house and you're really trying to navigate the politics of what's going on at your company, these principles all can be applied there as well. So as we know, it's not, and if you're in an agency, you definitely know this, it is definitely not the employer who pays the wages, it is the clients. 
Um, and the clients are the ones who make the decisions because they're the ones that have the money. So I'm not going to play this video. But basically, it's a guy who's getting in the in mirror and yelling, no, no, I'm not going to do it. And then the client walks up and says, let's make the logo bigger. And he says, yes, of course. Everybody's been there. You know, you're going to stand up to the client this time. We don't get there. But first, in order to, to get to how we handle that client, we need to define what is account service and what it's not. Clients will try to take things too far or take it to past where customer service should exist. Um, we're talking about what is the overall role of account service today and what will be the role tomorrow and what is the overarching goal of our account service. Client service. Showing the client and the firm your expertise. That is what the number one thing I want to do is show the client our expertise and manage the client's expectations. I'm also in charge of educating that client. I'm in charge of responding to the client's requests. I'm in charge of making sure the client's aware of the status of the account, providing the client with additional opportunities to grow that account, providing the client with additional uh, opportunities outside of the agency or outside of your own uh, business, and providing a defensible, pr providing defensible strategic advice. But what is it not? It's not doing everything the client says. That is definitely not part of account service. It is not keeping the client happy just to keep them happy. We have also some clients that could really grow if we pushed them and they may be happy with where they are, but we need to look at, at pushing them. Schmoozing with the clients, that means drinking, partying, flirting, etc. I have found that that is just not usually ever a good idea to have your employees hanging out and drinking and partying with your clients. And I've seen it happen a lot. Um, you are not about, in, in, in my agency, now this may be yours, you're not about assigning agency resources. That is something that, that uh, you, we don't want you to do. We want you to tell the problem and then we will we'll get the resources assigned. It's not about kissing anyone's ass because that's not how you grow a client relationship. Um, it's not about being an order taker, or I like to say a waiter. It's definitely not about waiting tables and doing exactly what the client says. And it's not about living in fear of a client. We'll talk about that in a little bit more in, in, in depth in just a second. But um, pissing on a client for no reason is not good either. Just because you're mad at them and doing something doing something to to spite them. I've had account people do that. That is, There's no reason to do that. And even if you're upset with, it, the, with the agency, it's a really horrible thing to do to your coworkers. Um, Allowing substandard work to go to a client, we, uh, your account management, you need to look at everything, every single thing that goes out. Don't just rubber stamp it and send it because at the end of the day, it, you're, you're usually the one that gets blamed if it's not right. And just looking dumb. I don't like my account people to look dumb. You, can, you don't have to know everything. In fact, I don't expect you to know everything, but I don't expect you to say something that, say something you don't know for sure and make yourself look dumb. Um, so that's something that I really preach, especially in younger folks that try to read, they'll read something and try and interject in a conversation in a context that, that may or may not be appropriate. So what are we doing now? We're providing a point of contact for that client. We're providing accountability. I mean, these are all things you can see. We're making sure the resources are there. We're keeping the client out of the CEO's hair. And this is something I'm going to tell you guys, keep, if you are internal, keeping the other decision makers out of your CEO or your big boss's hair about, about search by educating them is a big deal. Um, keeping the client happy, just keeping the clients happy pretty much. Uh, we need to guide the client on what they need to do. We need to document. That's a document what is done. Always, always document what you've done so that you can go back and look. I will tell you the clients and other people have recept have memories that are not always clear, let's just say. And um, I've, I can't tell you how many times we've had a client come. I said I wanted the budget to be five thousand, and you guys put it at seven. And then we can actually pull up a recording where the client said they wanted it at seven. You know, um, and, and try, trying to you know confirm those types of things and making sure you know double triple checking. Um, and we could provide the the client with what's going on in their reporting. And you should also. In account service, I know this is a lot of text here, but we're looking to establish the client's expertise. Why? Because expertise is what is going to make the client trust us. Uh, we need to direct their overall strategy, uh, identifying upsell items and stuff. Obviously, something I want my clients, my uh, my folks to do that your own business may or may not be into that. But uh, definitely, if you're in a client service and you're not providing um, 
You're providing a QA and quality assurance on, on everything the client receives. The last buck should be you as account management and making sure that there are no mistakes. And if you see anything, send it back or fix it. Um, communication is big. Uh, and a guidance with the clients and pushing them, pushing the clients where necessary. That's the hardest part I see for younger account executives or people who are new is pushing the client uh, to where they need to be in a way that doesn't make the client just up and quit. Um, but we need to be able to do that and, and have strategies for pushing the client to do what they need to do and challenge the client to do what they need to do and more. And also, we need to be able to identify additional client problems that the client may not even know they have. So what do you do? It's the most important thing you can do, and that is establish expertise. Establishing expertise is something that gets you in the door, keeps you in the door, and keeps the client working with you or keeps you in a job because they will come to you if you have the expertise. You need to do it with everybody in that, for individuals, firms management, firms vendors, firms processes. Uh, the, you, know, you need to establish expertise with the firm's philosophy, you, the reporting, the results, and with account so process, uh, the account service process itself. So what keeps a client from leaving or keeps you from losing your job? It's not if the client is your friend. I've had friends fire me many times. Uh, it's not because of your amazing responsiveness. It's not because you responded so quickly and they're always happy that you got you know, back to their email within five minutes, which that's unsustainable anyways, because eventually you're not going to be able to. And notice that client comes to expect that. It's a, um, in fact, sometimes in the beginning, don't, shh, don't tell, we'll actually delay communication just a bit, uh, just to set expectations uh, for going forward. It, it's not your, it's not a price, it, it, you know, it, it, we have had some clients where they've had to cut their budgets and stuff, but, and sometimes they'll, they'll say, I'm just going to leave because they don't think they can afford it. And we do, and I will go and cut their price, but that's not going to keep them. If they're, that's going to keep them if they're happy with things, that's going to keep them if they are, if they, if they see that, oh, maybe we can find uh, somebody who can do it cheaper, et cetera, even if your expertise is great, they say, those, are, those guys are great, but I just can't afford them. So it's not about your price, it's about keeping them. And it's not even about your stellar results. Gosh, this is anticlimactic. <laughs> clients leave when they think they can replace you. Bottom line. That is the only reason clients leave, and that's why people get fired too, because they think you are replaceable. If you, if you are putting yourself into a client situation and you're not doing a little bit of extra work to, in, to get yourself into that, uh, into that culture and understanding how you can, how you can become irreplaceable, um, you know, it, it, in, tr in, tr in truly, no one is irreplaceable, right? But it's very easy to be there for the client in a way and be there for your boss in a way that you seem irreplaceable. It seems like how much, how hard would it be to replace these guys? And this is a little cartoon, you know, is it, it just make sure you project, it, make sure you coordinate with the, the brand manager. It's old Dilbert cartoon, the category manager, and also the clients and the account execs and the project leaders and the strategic planning and the facilities planning and the product management and market IT. It's, and basically he said, all I heard was give up. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, and that, I've had client managers like that where they get overwhelmed and, if you are overwhelmed, you need to find help. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. That was just a cartoon about a, 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 a doctor who keeps, or a client who keeps saying, I want the, trying to haggle the price down of his surgeries. So, you know, you wouldn't do that, but we see it every day. I mean, even my account people are like, can we cut that to $500? No, it's a $4,000 project, you know? Um, and then they'll, they come and they know to come and bring me in. Um, but. What we talk about here, stages of client engagement, I'm not going to go over that because you're, you're about to get in there. Expertise every single time. Never forget the overall goal, which is to become irreplaceable. You're, ta you're taking the client, uh, we're talking to the client to convey your expertise. When you're talking on the phone, everything you need to be talking, you know, if there's, hey, there's a new Google, Google Core algorithm come out. If you're PPC, hey, have you seen these new ad parameters that Google just shut? Uh, let us see. Keeping them uh, engaged in what you're doing and if they, don't, if they don't know anything about it, educating them, go back to simple, show them what it can do, et cetera. But in the beginning, your expertise is harder to show. It's it, because it's, uh, it's, harder to, it's harder to come off without being like a blowhard or somebody who knows it all. But good account service keeps a client when the expertise is harder to prove. 
and that's by you do that by being nice and, and some of the other pillars that we have within within account service to to uh you know get a client established but um but down the road uh, you know uh, account service is a strong item in making every agency irreplaceable in fact i'd say it's the number one item uh that pushes us to to have that appearance of being irreplaceable as an agency and but at the end of the day communication is at the heart of good account service you need to communicate better service the account better show expertise better so we got this this is what i call the stages of a client relationship um and remember when you're talking to the client it's always always dating you never get married unless they buy you or something but first you got the sniffing butts phase where you're just kind of not sure who everybody is, then usually there's a challenge from the client. Sometimes there's not, but usually there's some sort of challenge that we have to get over. Then finally we get wary submission, usually at about three months, they're like, okay, you guys are not like the other SEO firms we worked with. You guys are not like the other, other places we worked with where we were getting ripped off and nobody was doing anything. Um, so we get wary submission. And then usually a, followed by a period of contentment. A period of contentment is everybody's, huh, but that's actually when we really need to be working to establish more expertise, to step, to become more irreplaceable, because then all of a sudden, it doesn't matter who you are, your client is going to have a random tantrum. That will look different for each client. Some of them are very quiet about it, and they just get quiet and they stop responding to you. Some of them will call you and yell you and dress you up and down. And inevitably, I don't care who you are, they're going to have a down month. And maybe, if you get, maybe even two in a row or three in a row just because of the nature of what seasonality. There's lots of things, as you all know, that can go into a down month. And your client's going to throw a random tantrum. Sometimes, if it goes too long in that contentment stage, you actually get a client that gets into boredom. And they start messing with things. Saying, what if we do this? What if we do that? SEO, PPC, is a grind. It's not a one-time workout and you've or you can run the marathon it is a, a grind every single day and when the clients get bored and start trying to add things um, in or say something that they read from neil patel <coughs> that was copied from joe laratro um you know they they really start um they really it really can really hurt the relationship because <coughs> it also moves them to grass is greener do you know how many emails i get a day about someone telling me how they can improve my SEO and they've looked at my site and they ha see a lot of ideas. Have those people ever looked at my site? No. Do they even know who I am? No. They're trying to pitch a guy who's been doing this for 30 years. And I'm just like, okay, your, your targets are off. How many do you imagine our clients are getting every day? And how many, how many are they meeting at conferences? You know, they go to their own conferences. And I can tell you that a lot of the people that are here speak at, the, at those niche conferences. <clears throat> you go to a legal conference, I promise you that there, there's an SEO speaking there. You go to a real estate conference, anything that the, your clients would go to, there's probably a marketing guy speaking there. And there's some power in speaking, and they can move someone over to the grass is greener. But then hopefully, if you get there past, and I've got clients now, I've got uh, my oldest client's 13, has been with the firm for 13 years. You'll get a second wind. And then this whole thing pretty much starts over with the exception of the sniffing butts, unless a new client person comes in. So that just it's really good to understand that. In my firm, deadlines are deadlines. And actually, the second most important thing, I will, uh, besides being, ir being irreplaceable, I will fire someone for missing deadlines. And that's one of the only things. I'll never fire you for making a mistake, but I will fire you for missing a deadline. I'm an old newspaper guy, so that is part of the reason. But also... I believe if we tell when we we should do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. So if you see a deadline that's going to be missed, if you see for some, for some reason you just can't make it, the minute that you think that, you pick up the phone, you call that client and tell them we may have a little problem with getting that deadline. The earlier you can do that, the better off you are. But when you do that, also make sure you're setting a new deadline. Don't just call them and say it's going to be delayed. You're setting a new deadline, and this is when it's going to be. Okay, if you don't set it, uh, if you don't do that, then things tend to get pushed back and pushed back, and uh, and even so, sometimes when you when you uh, cut a deadline, the client gets relieved too because they may have been behind on their own work. 
And if you don't push it out to another date, then they'll push it out and then it becomes a real problem. Uh, so, so even if the client says it's okay to miss a deadline, it's not okay, in my opinion. And, 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 and that is, missing deadlines will erode trust faster than just about anything else you can do in your firm, with the exception of maybe just being absolutely incompetent to someone who knows what they're looking at. But that's, I've seen, oh, in fact, when people come in to our firm, one of the reasons that they cite why they're leaving their existing firm is they can't meet deadlines. So uh, it's a big deal. And uh, don't ever, I, I will say to my, to the way you protect yourself from that is don't ever agree to a deadline you can't make. If the client says, I need this by the 9th, and you know there's no way you're going to get it to them until the 15th, fight back, push it back. Never promise and just say, we'll do our best. Do not commit to a deadline that you cannot make, even if the client tries to force you. <sighs> Clients, as I said earlier, have uh, memories that don't always recall exactly what happened. Uh, your client will forget what they said. It's your job in account service and when you're in-house to, to record what they say, whether that be recording in notes or actually having a, a tape recorder there. You need to record in pretty big detail what your client does. We, we use uh, Zoom and Google Meets pretty exclusively. In fact, I don't even like my, my folks to talk on their cell phones anymore because we don't get the recordings. We use Read a, a tool called Read AI that summarizes every meeting. I can send um, any client if they missed or any teammate if they missed a meeting in to go listen to the Read AI. It's been a godsend. And now for clients, it's in, but even before that, I we insisted every action item, everything was recorded. We would I no uh, there always had to be two people in a call just in case um, a client. You know we always have we have an oh, that we call we call account owner and backup. So they're sitting there, they're both sitting there in each call, no matter what. Um, we still do that, but now we've also got read AI, so, and we've got transcripts of everything that happens on those phone calls. Um, every phone call needs a contact report. Really easy now with the read AI or many of the other tools that are out there like that. I'm, I'm not married to read AI, it's just that's what we use. Um, it is, you've got to have that contact report uh, to send every, ev after every phone call you do with a client, send an email and saying what happened on the call and what the action items are and who's going to do what every single time. If you don't, you don't have a CYA when they come back and say, why wasn't this done? So, and it's good to repeat to the client what the client wants back to them, both verbally and in email because clients forget repetition is what's important in advertising and important in communication. If you continually tell them, okay, so we're going to do this and this and this, and you're going to do this, this, and this, it's going to be done by this date. Repeating that often and then also an email uh, usually cuts through a lot of confusion and a lot of problems that happen that I see happening in, in other agencies. Um, the, the, it seems like most of the problems come from somebody not writing down or communicating. Um, and you always keep a record of everything that was promised, every action item. Keep it always throughout the entire term of the project. I keep thing, I've got things from 13 years ago from this one client in a file. So I just I keep it all just so we can always go back and see what we did. Um, and it's, it's actually kind of funny to go back and look at what you were doing 13 years ago in the, in the reports you were providing. Managing your time. I always make sure a client knows that there is a hard stop on my calls, even if I don't really have one. Because I need the clients to understand that I'm controlling the time that we spend together. After all, most of us, really the only thing we sell in if an agency is time. And so we're giving, if we're giving away our product for free, that's not a good thing. Um, but if you, even if you're not, even if you're project-based, et cetera, you have to manage your own time. And sitting on a four-hour uh, conference call with a client while they go through stuff with their IT department that has nothing to do with you is a waste of your time. And it will happen. People will ask you to do that just because they're nervous and they want that backup. But that's not what they're paying you to do you, in most cases. I mean, uh, they're paying, if they're paying my guys $200 an hour to sit in a conference call and take notes, that's fine. Uh, I'll let them. But the client needs to understand that that money – that those hours are being used instead of something that is actually going to be productive on their, on their site. Um, sometimes I always make up, I'll make up fake meetings and put them on my calendar. So you can't see on Calendly that I have something for just a hard stop. And then I'll remove it after the call just so that, you know, the clients can say that, I, you know, I have an extra, I need to uh, have a hard stop at the, at the end of the call. 
if, and if the clients want under, want extra reports, which sometimes they do, well, they come in, I want this customized, I want a new looker dashboard, I want something new. The big thing is to understand why they want them. And if you think that it's something that's really going to help them, we won't even give them pushback. I'll just eat the extra hours, give them the reports. If it's something that's going to cause issues or cause confusion, we need to make sure the client's educated before we give them that data to come and either take action or get, because there's a lot of reports people will see, like just something in GA4 that their friend had, and it may not be, it may not be applicable to their client site. So make sure you're controlling that flow of information if you can. Uh, if you have a client that's an expert and goes ahead and does it, then make sure they're educated on what it means. Um, and I always like to, at least once a quarter, I do this with every client. We set a big idea meeting, and it's a separate meeting. We kind of maybe we'll buy them lunch or you know, uh, and, and do a Zoom lunch call. But that's when we come up with the ideas of things that, that they could do, but they're not doing now. Usually, things that have a sell that have an upsell for the agency. You know, big ideas like promotions, campaigns, etc. Um, and the client doesn't pay for that. Doesn't pay for that time that we prepare for it. Doesn't pay for the time we present it. Because I want them to see we're thinking about their account, and it's another way to become irreplaceable. Because some of those big ideas hit, and you make a lot of money, and so does the client. Response times. Never, never let a difficult email sit, ever. It doesn't go away. And there's no reason you shouldn't be responding to a difficult email as soon as you have the information to answer it. Remember that the client contacts you, they're thinking of you then, and they want a response. If you can respond quickly, like I said, you need to set those cadences and set expectations. But at the end of the day, if they're thinking about you and you want to get something done, contact them quickly because that's when they're available, when they're sending you that email. If you wait 24 hours to do that, they may be doing something else and may not be able, and, and all of a sudden you missed an opportunity to knock out some tasks with the client. Um, they want a response very quickly. Sometimes the best response is let me research and get back to you. I always try to get my guys to really quickly respond, just acknowledging that we've gotten the email and that we're working on it, um, even if they don't know the answer. Um, so, and I don't, this is something that's very generational. Don't answer phone calls with emails. If someone takes the time to pick up the phone call, you call them back. Um, it's except to give them a time when you will call, maybe. I'll call you at three. You know, don't, if someone picks up the phone and calls you, call them back because, uh, it's just a sign of respect. And trust me, if that person is wanting to talk on the phone, that's how they, that's usually their preferred form of communication at that particular time. So make sure you pick them up. Never be late to a meeting. Good God, please don't. And, and if you are calling in advance and let them know stuck in traffic, but, but if when you walk in five, 10 minutes and late to a meeting and you don't say why you just brush in, it makes you look arrogant. It makes you look like you're, you don't really care about their account. So definitely, uh, I, I tell my guys, leave, you know, if you have a meeting in, in person, I want you to leave an hour earlier than you thought, than you think you need to, or 30 minutes earlier than you think you need to. If you're on the phone, you better be on that Zoom call when it happens. And I instruct my guys that, and I got this number from a guy named David Baker, and I don't know why this number, it's this number, but seven minutes if you're on a call. If you're on a call seven minutes and they're not there and they haven't contacted you, then that call gets rescheduled because we don't want them wasting our time either. And uh, we tell them that in the onboarding process, process and everything. But definitely use your out of office when you're out of office. Proactively let clients that it may be, uh, you may be able to not uh, talk with them right then. And then if you've been out drinking, only respond with let me get back with you. Never try to answer client email. I've had this happen. And it, it's, it's, I've had this happen too many times. Never respond to a client when you've been drinking. Even if it's just a simple answer, wait till the next morning. Let them know that you'll, we'll get back to you. But it is sometimes drunken emails just go somewhere you don't want them to go. And so uh, my recommendation is to don't drink and drive the computer. Um, our clients, no matter how small they are, they want a sense of urgency. I had a client the other day that it disappointed me because he felt like he was low man on the totem pole. Even though he is one of my, he's, probably, he's my smallest PPC client, he, could, he said he could feel that we were, we were a low man on the totem pole. Some of that was him being a little paranoid. Some of that was probably a little bit of truth. So we added some some additional cadence points to his uh, cadence and touch points to his account. And he's happy now, at least from what I hear. <laughs> this is just last week. But clients want you. To, they want. You, I don't care if they're spending two hundred bucks with you. They want you to think that you're working feverishly on their accounts at all times. 
client wants you to, they want you to, and so, and that's not the reality. You know, we know that, that especially if you, even if you're in-house, you're working on one department stuff a period of the time and you're not working on it all the time. So um, always take those clients' ser uh, concerns seriously though, even if they are silly. If they don't think you're working on it fast enough, say, oh, we are, G give them reports, quick reports, you know, on, on the phone. Um, but, uh, and if, and if they are doing something bad, that's when you can push it up. And in, in my firm, they push it up to me or George, who's our chief operating officer, to 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 discuss with the client about how hours are used, et cetera. Because that's that can be hard for a younger account executive, and um, sometimes it's just not it doesn't feel appropriate. So we we definitely have supervisors that will come in, and hopefully you do too. If not, then just handle it like a supervisor would, and try not to lose, uh, try not to get the client angry at you. I like, I, I'm fine with the clients angry with me. I don't want them angry at my account people. Um, that's why we'd also separate money talk. My account people never talk about money. I'm the only one that talks about money. So, um, but we don't, you know, don't ever, I've had clients that can become friends with their clients. Don't talk about the heavy workload you've got with everything else. It does not inspire confidence. Don't bitch about your job to, to the, if you want to bitch about your job, come bitch about your job to me or your coworkers. Don't bitch about it to our clients. This makes us look bad, and it makes you know. Even if the client seems sympathetic, eventually they they will they will look at that and say, "We don't want to work with these guys anymore." Um, and if you're unhappy with your job, you need to talk to your boss because your client can't do anything about it. Um, and don't talk about your personal problems. Clients may pretend they care, and they'll they will if you. I mean, if like you know, you, your mother has cancer, or your dog gets really sick, and you had to miss a meeting because of something like that. Clients will ask you how things are. But don't go into getting in your clients, not your therapist. Um, there's a fine line there. It's, it's sur surface. I want you to become friends with your client. And if you become really close friends and you're out over a beer, that's fine. Talk about it. Talk about your personal problems. When you're on a client call, they're spending money with you on you. So make sure that you're keeping those, those personal things to a minimum. I say never more than 30% personal on a call ever. Um, it sounds like I don't like the banter, but I, I, that's actually my favorite part. But you have to keep it limited or uh, you will end up losing the client because they just won't feel like enough's getting done, even if you are doing the job. Um, and never panic. Your job is always to calm the client. If you see something bad happen, get a straight face on and say, we're going to fix it. You don't start panicking and saying, oh, my God, I can't believe this happened. Uh, you'll make it worse if you do that. Even if it's really bad, have a good bedside manner. How much time do I have? Okay. Um, what if what if you don't know? What if client asks you something you don't know? You won't know everything. That client, uh, the client wants your expertise, but a good client is not going to expect you to know everything. And if I ever hear a client, I've, I've had clients say this before, they just don't know what's going on because they've read something from Neil Patel again that Joe wrote. And so I'm having to... Uh, to go in and explain what these articles mean. And when that happens, I always put the kibosh on that as quickly as I can. Look, I trust this client service and hopefully your people will do will too. Trust this client service person. If you want some, if you want something maybe to back up, you can CC me or CC their, the other client owners. But um, if you don't, if, if they don't trust you because you don't know something, then they're probably not going to stick around for as a client for very long anyways. So I wouldn't get too attached. Um, but you know, it's okay to get back to them and just say, I don't know. And then go do the research. Do get back to them. We can research anything. You can find an answer to anything eventually. Um, don't, and if it's taking you too long, God, use your resources. People in this organization, people in other organizations, go reach out. And I can't tell you how many times something we don't know in our, in, in anybody in our agency doesn't know. I have lots of friends in this industry that I will reach out to and ask, what do they think? And we do it for each other. We do it for free. And find that group that can do that for you. But the last thing is do not make something up ever. Don't make it up just to get them to quiet because you can BS it, but you know, caveat with, I read something like, so give yourself an out. But if you're also BSing a client on something, even minor, they could make a major decision based upon that data that you've given them. And if it fails, then it's on you. So be careful on BSing answers. You know, if you, if, if they say, Oh, does click through data count for Google SEO? Well, Google just said it did in Washington, but for 25 years, they said it didn't. So I'll say yes, but maybe no. 
but I don't want them to get a big, you know, to be, to, if, if I just came in and said, yes, Google said it in Washington. Well, is that true? They did say it in Washington. But is it true they've been, they, they have not publicly to the webmaster world come out and said that it's a, it's a, it's a factor? They have not. So you can make your best guess there, but you don't know. And if you and if they make a decision based upon that ex particular example, it could really affect their overall strategy and overall results. You need to over communicate concisely. I don't like big long emails. Big, nobody likes big long emails. Keep your emails concise. You know, be like Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, "I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time." And it's very true. It takes longer to actually write something short and, that act, that conveys your points. But involves over communication. Everybody sucks at this. My team sucks at this. Even internally, I still get emails that are ten paragraphs long to the team about something. Keep it short because people, if they see a big wall of text, even SEOs a lot of times get intimidated and don't read it. Um, you need to work on explaining things clearly and concisely, and understanding your client's level of sophistication. I got one client that knows SEO as good as I do, if not better. Uh, what I communicate to him is very different from what I will tell the girl who just got out of college and got a job uh, working the front desk at uh, the plumber that I'm working for, who has no idea what anything we're doing is. Those level, you have to, it, you can't, that's why we don't do cookie cutter reports, because you can't. If you cookie cutter reports, you're going to either send somebody who's really advanced something too simple and they're going to get mad, or you're going to send somebody who's not advanced something they can't understand at all. The same report's not going to work for both of them. So you need to, to really work on explaining things and uh, customize to your bosses, to your to your clients. You need to avoid jargon as much as possible, um, even with knowledgeable clients. It's just better to, to avoid the jargon of our world because um, it changes. Um, and keep it simple. Uh, always explain processes in linear fashion. This, this is, it could be a whole speech on itself, but um, I'm a real big fan of saying, First, second, next, and using Gantt charts if there's things going on at the same time, or under, or if I'm doing a process, making sure they understand this is the chicken, this is the egg, right? Or the egg and the chicken, whatever it is. They, but the client needs to really understand the process um, and the over and get the big picture, no matter what. So you need to understand. But in order to get to communicate that, you have to understand their level of sophistication. You need to. Um, it, bullets work better than blocks of text in email. That's just a trick. I'm going to tell you, if you've got a giant block of email, go in there and bullet point some stuff out. It just makes the email look easier to read, and it doesn't overwhelm everyone. And then over-explain. Assume your clients are dumb until they prove otherwise, because I've found that that is usually the case. And your client style. What... One of the, the unique things that we do at Right IMC, and I encourage anyone else to do them, and we use a company called Culture Index. They're a little expensive, but there's tons of other places you can get this done, is I run personality tests for my clients. I ask them to do a personality test. Um, I also ask my, my employer employees to do a, the same personality test, but we can look at a personality test and understand a client's work style. Are they extremely detail-oriented? Are they more social or aggressive? Are they really focused? I can tell you all of those things and give you give you a pretty decent, here's how this person's going to be to, able to work with just by them taking that personality test. It helps us avoid pitfalls. Like if we're going with, if we're working with someone who's extremely detail oriented, I give them account executive who's not ex extremely detail oriented, that can be a problem. So even I even look at it before I'm assigning who's going to be on the teams. I'm asking the clients for a personality test. And I, I do highly recommend it. I don't know of anybody else that's doing it besides us, but I would love to hear other people do it and exchange. Uh, if, you get, if you do start doing it, please re reach out to me so we can e exchange best practices. Um, sorry? They love it. They love it. And I'm going to tell you, because what I do is I offer to go over it with them after. And ev I don't care who you are. You want somebody to go over your personality test. Unless you're psychotic. But, you know, uh, I mean, most people jump at the chance to have me just, and all I'm doing is explaining what they explained to me in the training of the, I'm not an expert on personality tests. I just know this particular one because they, tr I've had training in it. And so I can give them a, you know, here's, and here's some of the things you might be struggling with in your personality and, you know, all of the, and they love that. But then we have an extremely valuable piece of data that helps us to work with our client. Uh, and, and I'll do, I do it also like when, uh, you know, we always make to try to do it when a, 
a new person comes on board the team and the client side. You know, we use culture index. Culture, and the reason I use it's expensive. I, I'll tell you how much it costs. It's about six thousand dollars a year for this license, but but you get unlimited surveys and unlimited um, uh, and unlimited analytics for it. So it's uh, that's why I like it. There are, I mean, there are disc tests you can get for eighty or ninety bucks that are good if you can if you understand disc. Myers Briggs, even I don't like Myers Briggs. I don't feel like it tells us enough. But yeah, there's 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 lots of them out there. I mean, you don't have to go with what I do. We just I use it for internal and external. So it's it's a it's a it's an investment, but I feel like it's an investment that has a great ROI for us, as far as just keeping clients on board. Um, but I mean, you know, you can go through all these. Are they are they micro? Do they micromanage? Are they aloof? All these things you need to know. And use your client style to your advantage. If your client style doesn't match you, maybe look on your team and see if there's someone that does match, or you, or you may have to work out of your comfort zone for a little while, which actually my personality test tells me how long someone should work out of their comfort zone before they get too burnt out. But if you have to work out of your comfort zone, make sure that you're watching af out after yourself and your own attitudes, because I've seen when someone works outside of their comfort zone, all of a sudden they can start, their customer service starts to suffer because they get burnt out, they get mad, um, and they just get tired of their job. And when you're tired of your job, it's no fun. So, you know, uh, talk to your bosses about that. I don't know if you have sympathetic bosses, but I tell you, I'll switch a client, I'll switch an account service people person like that. If they come and tell me, I don't think I'm meshing with this client because they know, they know now if they do it all the time and all of a sudden they don't, they find themselves without any clients, they're probably not going to have a job for very long, but I haven't had that problem yet. So, um, let's just pray. We don't should you be your client's best friends. It is harder to fire friends than it is to fire vendors. I will admit that no matter what. Friends, however, get asked for favors. And it's difficult to talk money with friends. Being close to a client can cause you to lose the consultant effect. What is the consultant effect? I'll tell you a real quick story. A guy who actually for the last eight years was my uh, chief operating officer. Um, now he's doing something else, but... Uh, actually he went to work for a client, but he, for years, he was my client at American airlines and we became, we were really good friends. I mean, we were actually good. I got him the job at American airlines. He was my roommate in college. This guy and I knew each, how each other think. And, um, he, uh, basically he would come up with these ideas at American that were really good and things that they needed to do, but they would not listen to him because he was on the team and they thought his ideas were just you know, somebody on the team, we're going to blow that off. He and I would go meet, have drinks or lunch. He'd tell me what his ideas were. I would put a presentation together and bring the same idea in and get it passed because I was the consultant and they were paying me $250, $300 an hour. So I knew what I was talking about, even though it was the exact same idea. As an agency, you have a consultant effect. If you're in-house, you may or may not with different departments, but you have a consultant effect that gives you power. They are paying you for your idea. So use that, but you can lose it if you become too close. Because once the once the veil is lifted and they know you real well and they, you know, they know about your personal problems and blah blah blah, that consultant effect can be lost. So use it to your effect to your advantage because you don't want to lose it if you can avoid it. And friends are more likely to recommend you for future projects, so that is good to know. You know, that's that's a good reason to be really good friends. But in general, I say yes. Probably not being the best friend of somebody, you know, so uh, it depends on your style. But like, uh, you know, I have people who have been who are best friends with with their, a couple that we had in a business that divorced. And when they divorced internally, my guys took sides. And so, you know, we, we had to be very careful with that for a while. Uh, now that now it's better because the, their divorce is over. But still, you have to, you know, there, it's becoming friends with a client has some very Big risks, but it also has some very big rewards. Um, social situations. This is something I tell my guys. I'll go through this real quick. Don't get drunk with your clients. Just don't do it. Don't 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 flirt with your clients. If you know, uh, we've had some girls that have done that before, trying to get more, you know, with the client, trying to get the client to do more stuff for them, and it, that is a bad idea. It does not work out. Uh, try to stay away from politics, religion. Other controversial items. We haven't, I haven't had that happen in a while, but during the election, it can happen. Someone, a, a client, maybe, you know, a client just 
assumes that you're voting for Trump and you're voting for Biden and they say something that offends you. And then all of a sudden you're, you know, you've got to have a thicker skin. Just let it go. It's a client. If you don't agree with their politics, that's fine. Go write a blog later. Let's not argue with them uh, on the phone. And if they're, but if they are abusing you, I want to know that. If you're connected to clients on social media, use your common sense, okay? Don't put your bong pictures on your Facebook page if you've got your client sitting there. You know, uh, and unless you know, unless you know that the client advocates your cause, I really don't like people ask my my people asking for donations um, for anything, just because it is a, a you never know how someone's personal feelings are on any organization. So if we're going to do something and ask for donations, we do it as a company. Everybody does it instead of one person coming in, even on like softball, like, you know, this is my soft, my kid's softball uh, deal. Well, you know, it's better off if the whole team's selling your team, your kid's softball thing, instead of you just trying to sell it anyways. And I just want to make sure that we're not selling something that's going to affect anyone in any way. And sometimes you just don't realize it. Sometimes you don't realize what you're uh, selling could really affect somebody. Um, and unless you know that, yeah, unless you know, they advocate your cause. Now, if you know, they're like, you know, they're a wild horse fanatic and you guys talked about wild horses and, and you've got a wild horse uh, thing that you can donate to. You can send her the link to that. I'm fine with that. If it's, even if it's yours, if you've talked about that, but it's, it's definitely better if it's better to, to talk to in our firm, to talk to the agency. I don't know about a, your own individual situation there, but that's how we handle it. And that's how I would tell your boss to handle it. So this is the fourth section. We'll get through real, real quick. Um, Cause this is important. Uh, about talking about upset clients and what do you do when a client's upset? The question that when a client comes in upset, the first question I ask is, is this problem truly affecting the client's program or business? Because a lot of times clients are freaking out about things that aren't going to matter. And in that case, it's your job to calm them down and show them this is not a big deal. This is not a big bump in the road. Uh, and is there a quick solution? No matter whose fault it is, no matter if it was IT department or we screwed up, is there something we can do to fix the problem if it's like a real you know, technical issue? Can we fix it really quickly? Or is it something that is going to take a while to fix? Um, sometimes it's better, even if it's, your, if it's their fault and they're blaming you, that they're saying you did it, even if you didn't. It's, it's go, and if you can fix it, go fix it. And then you can go back to the client later and show them that you didn't do that problem. I can't tell you how many times we've done that, where an IT person flips the wrong button or something, and then the, the site is you know, not down or not performing and they, the client gets really angry at us and we log in, we fix it, but then we go back and look at the logs and show them this was not us that did this. Um, so it, you know, it's, but it's, it's important to do that because you don't want the client think blaming you for something. And usually they don't care. They, I don't care who did it. Just got it fixed, you know? So, uh, but I, it is important because they keep a mental checklist in their head of when you do things wrong. Now, the good thing is, is that one really good thing, like, I mean, I always say, you know, getting a link in the Wall Street Journal. You know, link in the Wall Street Journal, your client's going to be happy with you. And even when you screw up, they're going to be thinking back. But remember when they got me that link in the Wall Street Journal before they fire you? So those th types of things are golden, but they're always keeping that mental tick of, of any time that something gets screwed up. And in our business, I don't care who you are, things get screwed up. It just happens. Websites don't get launched right. There's code issues. It, it, it doesn't matter. Something's going to happen. It's how you handle it that is important. Um, and you know, you want to make sure is a client upset by something we did. If that is, I always ask for, I, I ask, you know, escalate it, but also if it is something we did, we need to fix it. And is it our fault? You know, if it's our fault, we take it up the chain immediately. Don't wait. Don't try and fix it to yourself. I, I encourage you if you're in-house or anything and something screws up, take it up the chain as quickly as you can. Don't sit there on it. It looks like you're hiding it. Um, but in this litigious world we live in, do not admit fault. No matter what, I say, I'm sorry this has happened. We'll work through fault later, even if it is our fault. Don't tell them you're sorry that you did something, or because honestly, that's where lawsuits come from, and nobody wants that. Um, and do you have documentation on the issue? Do we, you know? I was talking earlier about how we get all these calls and we record all the calls, and 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 if the client's saying something, we did something that we didn't do, or we did something that, or they told us to do something, and now they're saying they didn't want us to do it. We can go back and look at those calls and, and actually assign what happened. But the big thing about when clients are upset is empathy. I think empathy is the superpower of the account service person. It is what will keep your clients versus what will and, and make you irreplaceable versus what will just make you a vendor. 
And, and half the battle of dealing with upset clients is to put yourself in their shoes. You know their personality profile, so you know how they react to things. Put yourself in their shoes of what's happening and how, you know, is their boss coming down on them so hard about this that they're going to get fired? Is it, you know, what, what's going on that's causing the client to be upset? And when you do that, you can, be cli- you can be sorry that a client is upset without being sorry about what you did even or what you didn't do. So make sure that you're, you know, tell, you're, you're telling with the client and empathizing with them, putting yourself in their shoes to understand why this is such a big deal um, and understand the emotional state of your client. You know, sometimes we're dealing with clients who are having personal problems themselves, other issues. You never know what's going on in someone's head, and that affects how you deal with other people. So we need to understand what they're like, what the client you know, is like, and when they're upset, why are they upset, and how can we fix it, and let's put ourselves in their shoes to try and see what's going on. And move it up the chain, best thing to do is escalate. Understand the different, you know, if the client's threatening to fire us, and this is my training for my guys, remember this. If we made a mistake, let your management know. If the client's abusive, I want to know right away. I've fired four clients for being abusive to my team, and I don't stand for it. I don't stand for clients yelling. I don't stand for clients cussing. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah. Connotates abuse is... is if it's some, they're upset about the account, that's not. But if they start going turning it personal, if they start uh, using language that is absolutely true, you know, a, a good damn or hell or f word or whatever is okay every once in a while. But using it all the time at at someone is not acceptable. Um, you know, we've had I had to let one client go because he liked to hit on my accounts people. You know, uh, so you know. That's and if I find out about that, I will. I don't care how big the client is. I let them go. Not everybody's like that, and I understand because if you have a client that's, if you're having cash flow problems and you've got a, cl- a big giant client and they do something wrong, it's that it's hard to let it go. Especially if you have to let them go and know that you're going to have to do layoffs. I've had that happen before, where I somebody did something, or somebody did something to one of my guys. I had to let the client go, but then I had to lay off the person that was affected because I couldn't afford it anymore and that that's that nobody wins in that situation and i hate that but it does happen um you know you need to understand the difference between a routine issue and items that need escalation um uh, when i get that's a big deal for for my new account people because i don't want them escalating everything and they need to understand when it's appropriate and you know escalation shows we care about their problems but it also if it's something that is an everyday thing that's not escalation if it's something they ask you to do an action item and you don't agree with it, that's not an escalation until it becomes one. You know, you've got to understand what is an escalation and what's not, or you'll drive your boss crazy. I always, my big big deal, I always tell my guys, think about it and come to me with three solutions before you come and ask me about it. So they have to come in with three things they think will work. And then we, then we'll, but that shows me that they've actually thought about it as opposed to just, daddy, I can't get it done. And not that I'm the daddy, but that's I have four kids at home, and that's kind of how I feel sometimes. So how to apologize without giving away the farm? Uh, like I said earlier, when you admit fault, you do uh, put the company up to a lawsuit. And always say, oh, let me look into it, or I'm sorry that that's ha- I'm sorry that I'm sorry that you feel that that's happened to you. Sorry that you're dealing with this situation, um, but you can't get in trouble for being t- sorry that a client is disappointed. Whoops. Okay, well, it did die, but anyways, uh, but you get you get you get the point there, and I'm I'm pretty much done. Uh, that, there's two more slides there, but uh, we've got, you know, when when we're looking at a client, our the big takeaways I want you to, to do is work to become irreplaceable with your clients, show them empathy in good times and in bad. Be careful about becoming too close of friends to your clients, and never miss a deadline. If those, if the, if you take away those things, I feel like I've been successful in this uh, in this particular session. And I apologize for being a little bit late and the computer time. But um, oh, if, I, I don't know if we, I don't think we have any time for questions. Do we? No, yeah. uh, there is lunch, but feel free to stay. And, and ask I'm here all day, so just, if you have any questions about today or anything how we run it, come talk. To me. Oh, one last thing. I got to put in a new plug. Uh, I've, uh, I'm not telling everyone here, but we're officially launching probably next week. Um, my fractional CMO services we're just launching. The website is Texas CMO. Just go look at it, see what you think. Tell me, give me, I'd love to hear your, you know, feedback on the site, feedback on the service. 